Hey everyone, I'm Cameron Bertuzzi and you're watching the third video of a playlist of videos responding to 20 arguments against God's existence. If you want the link to the playlist, just check for it in the description. All right, let's get into the third argument. Drowning just about everything alive? Not a sign of love. So we're already three videos in, and two out of the three are arguments against the Bible. They're not actually against God's existence. And I mean, the third argument actually isn't even an argument against the Bible at all. It's against one interpretation of a couple of chapters in the book of Genesis. And I mean, you can't even say that it's against a literal interpretation of that text because there are many different literal interpretations. And to make matters worse, Hemet doesn't even think a global flood even happened. Right? I mean, he's an atheist. So, I'm wondering how an imaginary event can be evidence against God's existence, on his view. Now look, I get that he's trying to give a kind of like internal critique for Christians, but an internal critique for Christians is not an argument against God's existence. At the very, very most, this is an argument against one group of Christians that hold to one particular interpretation of a couple chapters in the book of Genesis. That's it. Worst case scenario means that the Christians in question would have to adopt a different interpretation. Now, to be clear, I don't think that Hemet's argument, if we can call it one, accomplishes that. He hasn't actually argued that God could have no moral reason for using a global flood. So this is neither a serious argument against God's existence, and it's not a good argument against the global interpretation of the flood. All right, with that out of the way, let me take a couple minutes and talk to the Christians that are watching this video. There's a really great book that came out recently called Understanding Scientific Theories of Origins. Pretty awesome book. I mean, it's also the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Chapter 13 in the book is dedicated to understanding the flood account. They conclude, the authors in the book, conclude that we actually don't know from the text what the scientific dimensions of the event were. One of the reasons for this is that the two Hebrew words kol eretz, which gets translated all the earth, are used hyperbolically elsewhere in scripture. I'll give two examples. First, Kol Eretz is used in Exodus 9-4 where it says all of the livestock in Egypt died in the plague. But we know that the author is using hyperbole because later on in Exodus, the people are actually called to bring their livestock in from the field, meaning that they all didn't die. So even though the text said that all the livestock died, that didn't actually happen. The author was using hyperbole. Second, in Genesis 41-57 we read, quote, in all the world, which are the same two words here, kol eretz, came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere, end quote. However, no one reads this verse thinking that like Mayans or Eskimos came to buy grain. What these two verses do is show that the words kol eretz can be used hyperbolically. And in fact, the authors in the Old Testament often used hyperbole when describing these sorts of epic events. But what about the wording in Genesis 7.20 where it says that the waters covered the mountains by 15 cubits, which gets converted to about 20 feet? The authors point out how the actual sequence of words in Hebrew reads like this, quote, 15 cubits upwards, the waters surged and covered the mountains. End quote. So if we're taking this passage like as literally as we can, all that would mean is that the waters rose 20 feet up the sides of the mountain, not that it was covered by 20 feet above. And here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that the global interpretation of the flood narrative is false. To quote the authors again, quote, if words mean different things, we need to explore these possibilities because one of those possibilities may be what the author intended. End quote. What we were taught in Sunday school may not be what the Hebrew authors actually meant to say. And as truth seekers, we should be open to these scholarly possibilities. In summary, this is not in any way an argument against God's existence. At very best, it's an argument that we should adopt a different interpretation of the flood narrative in Genesis. But since Hemet never actually argued that God couldn't have a moral reason for using a global flood, this is not an argument against a global interpretation. Of the Bible. Oh, and so for any like skeptics that are still watching this, I'm not arguing that a global flood happened. I'm saying that Hemant's argument, as in the way that it was presented, it fails. That's all I'm saying. All right, well, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, again, hit the like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel. I partnered with Mike Winger. He's a good friend of mine. He's addressing the next argument. And this one, the next argument is actually about the Bible too. And Mike is somewhat of a genius when it comes to the Bible. So you don't want to miss it. It's also kind of spicy. So go check it out. If you're already in the playlist, just sit tight. It's automatically going to go to the next one. But if you're not in the playlist, click it. It's in the description of the video. I'll see you guys in video number five.